Welcome to the recorded version of the Grantmakers and Aging Web Seminar, Recent Changes at the Administration on Aging, Impact on the Aging and Disability Networks, featuring Kathy Greenlee, Assistant Secretary for Aging, and John Feather, CEO of Grantmakers and Aging, from July 2nd, 2012. This event was made possible by a partnership between Grantmakers and Aging and the John A. Hartford Foundation. Technical and production support is provided by the American Society on Aging. And at this point, I would like to turn the floor over to John Feather, who is the Grantmakers and Aging CEO, and he's going to be talking to you and getting this session started. Welcome, John. Thanks very much, Steve, and welcome to all of you for this special edition of Conversations with GIA. As Steve mentioned, I'm John Feather. I'm the CEO of Grantmakers and Aging, and we are delighted to have over 800 of you joining us today. Before we start, I want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation of New York for providing continuing support for this webinar series. I also want to thank the expert team at the American Society on Aging for providing technical and production support for the series. On April 16th of this year, Secretary of Health and Human Services Kathleen Sebelius announced a major reorganization of the federal programs on aging and disability with the creation of the new Administration for Community Living, or ACL. It brings together the Administration on Aging, the Office on Disability, and the Administration on Developmental Disabilities into a new agency. While coordination across federal programs to meet the needs of older adults is broadly supported, some in the community have wondered what this really means for the aging and disability networks. Will this mean less emphasis on aging or disability at the federal level? How will the new agency actually work? Will future heads of the administration have both roles? It is an honor to have a distinguished guest today to guide us through these and other questions about the change. Kathy Greenlee serves in the dual roles of administrator for the new administration for community living and assistant secretary for aging. She was appointed by President Obama as the Assistant Secretary for Aging in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and confirmed by the Senate in June 2009. Welcome, Secretary Greenlee. John, thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with you, and I would like to thank you for rescheduling. I know we were um, scheduled for a couple of weeks ago. You and I had a chance before we started to compare notes about losing electricity in this area, and uh, it was just very helpful that we had a chance to do this. And what a fabulous audience you have. I have done enough public speaking. I have a mental image of 800 people in a room, and this is a very large crowd. So uh, hello to all of you out there. I'm very glad to be here. I have a few slides uh, that I'd like to go through, but this has really been designed to answer questions. Uh, I have had the opportunity to speak quite a lot about uh, our reorganization, so I will try to anticipate a few questions as well as I do um, the explanation. I was uh, very much hoping to be joined today by Henry Claypool, and uh, he was really called away suddenly um, by something quite unexpected, uh, because from the beginning when we were scheduling this, I was hoping that Henry could be here as well uh, and dem demonstrate his support uh, for both aging and disability issues that we're working with at the Administration for Community Living. So let's start with the slides and let me uh, let's go to the next slide. Go to the next slide and, and let's just flip through. Uh, the first slide is just a, a graphic. Uh, we are currently in the process of updating logos, graphics, mission and vision statements, kind of the uh, infrastructure that we need for the new organization. So this is a nice kind of entry graphic and statement from the secretary. I might start, uh, as we're on this picture with the Secretary, and talk about the tremendous support we have from leadership at the Department, Secretary Sebelius, um, Deputy Secretary Core, uh, the budget staff. I mean, without, within the Department of Health and Human Services, there's been quite a lot of excitement and support for the creation of the Administration for Community Living. It's the first time in two decades that HHS has formed a new agency, and it would not have been possible without their support, and their support has been unwavering, uh, which will be important moving forward because we reorganized hoping to uh, take advantage of some opportunities, find new opportunities, and so their support uh, it will be key to our kind of continuing success as we move forward. So let me do the overview and the org chart and uh, in that way be able to uh, kind of get into the, the specifics of what we've actually done. 
As John said, this was announced in April. Uh, the creation of the Administration for Community Living uh, is a new operating division, which means it's a standalone agency within Health and Human Services and a new kind of umbrella structure that brought together the Administration on Aging, uh, which uh, most of us, I think, on the call are familiar with, uh, the Office on Disability, the Administration on Developmental Disabilities. Let me start with ADD. The Administration on Developmental Disabilities has been located over the Administration for Children and Families. Many years ago, a couple of decades ago, AOA and ADD existed in the same agency, and then a AOA was moved out um, at the behest of the, the advocates who uh, wanted to have a separate agency for aging. Uh, so in many respects, having AOA and ADD together, is like coming home together, um, is not a brand new concept, but a revisited concept. In the process of moving um, the Administration on Developmental Disabilities into the new agency, we also added the word intellectual to the name to reflect kind of the current both thinking and support uh, in the DD community for people with intellectual disabilities. So as you will see when we do the next slide, the new name is the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Structurally, um, Sharon Lewis, who's the commissioner of ADD, uh, within the structure at the Administration for Children and Families, has reported directly to the Assistant Secretary. Uh, in this new change, she reports directly to the administrator of ACL. Uh, in my role as administrator, she reports to me. So ADD is not buried any further in an agency. In fact, is now a significant part of a smaller agency and uh, feels, and when you talk to ADD and their, their advocates, uh, that they will have more ability to help shape policy that will impact people with intellectual dis disabilities, developmental disabilities, and their families. The Office on Disability is probably less well known, especially to the aging community. The Office on Disability is uh, a staff of seven or eight individuals with policy expertise uh, on disability and long-term supports and services. It has existed in the office of the secretary as an extension of the secretary's office. And it's been charged with the responsibility of helping to inform disability policy across the broader Department of Health and Human Services. Henry, Henry Claypool was the director of the Office on Disability. And this office has been incredibly important to people in the disability community, whether it's people with developmental disabilities or phys physical disabilities, the broader disability community, because Henry has had direct access uh, to the secretary, and that's important for the disability community. As we reorganized, uh, we have worked hard to protect um, that autonomy and ability of Henry to, much like me, retain the responsibility of advocacy uh, and also find an opportunity to work together, and I'll explain that as we get to the org chart. The new agency is charged with developing policies and improving supports for seniors, people with disabilities. We spend a lot of time talking about family support, uh, family caregivers, uh, family support in, in the IDD world. They use slightly different language to talk about families and family caregivers, but uh, the role of family with a broad definition of family is very important to all of the populations that ACL serves and will continue to be a good example of how we can approach some issues together uh, with a very common sense of need. So, This is a slide I'll spend the most time on and then I can flip through the last two pretty quickly. Uh, as I, this describes kind of the new kind of umbrella structure uh, where we have created uh, the Administration for Community Living headed by an administrator. You'll see an asterisk on this slide that denotes that the administrator is also the Assistant Secretary for Aging. I'll talk about that. A Principal Deputy Administrator who also, as noted, serves as the Secretary's Principal Advisor on Disability Policy. Henry Claypool and Sharon Lewis and I, the, the three leaders of these uh, kind of key organizations, wanted to find a way to build a structure that we could work together and wanted to do that in a way that would be respectful uh, and reflective of the different communities that we serve. But you can't really, in a federal structure, just build a coalition. Uh, we already were working in coalition. We have felt for the whole time we've been uh, working in this administration that would be stronger together. So how do we build a structure, a physical structure, that moves us all in and achieves the balance of common purpose and also unique identity, and this will be the ongoing kind of charge and responsibility of ACL to find that balance, to be reflective of uh, very um, 
strongly self-identified advocates and communities with people with different kinds of needs and similar kinds of needs. Uh, so, so we created an, a new structure. Uh, programmatically, underneath that structure, this is what we have. We have the Administration on Aging that still exists. The Administration on Aging will continue to support the Older Americans Act programs. Uh, we have other programming through AOA from kind of the prevention dollars, public health, health act dollars. This is really our aging program services. And for ACL, the bulk of our funding. Uh, and when we made this change, we didn't change the Older Americans Act. Uh, it still applies to the same populations that it's uh, applied to. It was, it was not changed. And thus, most of the money coming to ACL will continue to support those, those programs. Uh, the next piece is the Administration for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. The supports that AIDD provides in the disability community are different than the supports that AOA provides. AOA has um, really the opportunity and responsibility to provide direct services to seniors and their family members. Uh, for many years, those of us working with AOA have also been reaching out to the disability community. You can see that reflected in the 2006 amendments to the reauthorization of the Old Americans Act. Aging and Disability Resource Centers were admitted into the law. AIDD has a slightly different role. They provide more systemic support for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their families. They support projects of national significance. They support um, the Disability Rights Network, the state DD councils, and the universities that operate the University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Uh, what they don't have is direct program support for uh, individuals who need support and families. Uh, much of that support in the community comes from Medicaid. Uh, AIDD support has been slightly different. And frankly, they have some things that the Asian community would like to have. I mean, the investment in university research is something that um, AIDD has been able to bring to the table in a different way than AOA. Uh, in this new structure, we moved the AOA regional offices to report to the larger organization. Uh, for now and really the, the immediate future that we can see moving forward, most of the work of the regional offices will continue to be focused in the field of aging because that's how our funding has been developed. But we have been charged at AOA for many years to do more outreach to people with disabilities, and we will be better at that now spending Older Americans Act dollars to uh, do a better job of, of partnering with disability community. Uh, you won't see until we can find another revenue source any uh, real strong ability to be able to staff up uh, with disability kind of expertise in the regional offices. So we will need to kind of cross train and grow and improve um, our base. This is a, a better structural position for the future and helps us work on the integrated programs that we're currently running. Uh, AIDD has not worked in a, in a regional structure. They have worked with uh, states and the universities, disability rights centers out of Washington, so they're not kind of used to a regional structure. And it will be really an ongoing conversation with our various stakeholders about what will ACL's role be in the region and how can we staff and support that role, uh, what is needed. Uh, and they may not be the same things for these different populations, uh, but that is why structurally we moved uh, the regions, uh, not that it will feel much different on the ground right now, but for the strength of the organization in the future. Uh, we need to be able to represent all of our work outside of Washington. And I, having come from the middle of the country and a state government person for a long time, value regional work. I, I want to have a presence uh, in the regions. Uh, the next piece is the Center for Disability and Aging Policy. This is the shop that John Wren uh, has been running uh, and continues to run in this integrated way. Most of the Office on Disability, um, Henry Claypool's program staff have moved into this policy office so that we can continue to carry out the mission of the Office on Disability, but the mission of the Administration on Aging, which is to uh, look for policies that we can develop and continue to look for innovation in all the different fields uh, represented by the new organization. And then we have a management and budget function. Uh, this has been moved out. Dan Berger has served as the director of that and continues to be kind of the HR uh, management side uh, that supports the larger organization. What we don't have, and let me talk about what's, what's not here, uh, we do not have in this structure uh, direct uh, kind of formal relationships with the independent living centers. Uh, the IL community is, is still supported out of the Department of Education. Uh, we have relationships with people people's Department of Ed, uh, but we don't have specific program dollars kind of in the field of physically disabled uh, other than some of the integrated programs that we're running. 
so let me talk about and uh, anticipate a couple of questions, if I can. Let me talk about the name uh, Community Living and talk about what we have done and what we have not done. Uh, we never pursued or entertained the idea of adding disability to aging. Uh, states have done that. I know people on the call have questions about that. Why didn't we add disability to aging? We never felt that that was the right way to find the right balance, and my favorite word is equilibrium, across the fields. That it was not the way to, uh, I guess, support the work the best. Disability is its own field in its own right with its own history and should not be seen as an amendment to or an add-on to aging it is different. Uh, there are commonalities, but it is different. And we need to create an organization that is respectful of these differences, finds what they have in common. But we need to reflect disability culture and aging culture and the people that we serve. States have done this in various, in various ways. Uh, we needed a new place to all be together. Uh, and people who advocate for each of these different fields still need to advocate for the different fields. How do you build a new place that you can all be together so that you can get about the work? We did that by creating a new organization and keeping AOA as the, uh, as the part of the agency that will focus on aging services. But we did not want to add disability to aging. Uh, we then started looking for the right language. Uh, the, you know, the administration on aging and disability still would have seemed like we were adding disability to aging, even if we've had this exact same org chart and was not something that the disability community would have embraced. Uh, they have had their own organization as well through the Office on Disability and AIDD. We chose community living because it best reflected the missions of the three entities we brought together, but it is also aspirational. And in this respect, it's kind of new for people. Uh, community living is what all the people we serve aspire to, and it's what we know, working with seniors, they aspire to. I mean, people want to live in their communities. If you read uh, the Older Americans Act, the mission statement of AOA, it's about providing community supports for individuals, helping them avoid a nursing home admission or hospital admission. So we chose community living because it stakes kind of our, our claim of our differentness. Uh, it also is a nice reflection of the difference between what we're doing and the rest of the Department of Health and Human Services. For the first time, the department writ large has an agency that focuses on a community and social model in the name. And we are not the medical model. We are the community services branch. For the entire department to support that is huge because it means we have within this organization access to our sister agencies who can help us fulfill that mission by supporting uh, services in the community and really, I think, positions us well. Uh, the name falls short uh, in a couple of ways. I think all of us from the various disability and aging communities, if we sat down and had a conversation, what do people need, would name pretty quickly mental health services, that mental health, uh, whether it's people with uh, kind of mental health conditions that are disabling, severe mental illness, people with depression, that's less disabling. Uh, mental health services are important for all of our communities, and we need to strengthen our partners partnership with SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Each of us, the three entities, have separate relationships with SAMHSA. We need to shore those up and, and find out as a new organization how those can be even stronger. The mental health services are very important. The other way that community living falls short is that we are still very much committed to the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program and the Older Americans Act and understand that we have a number of older adults in this country who live. Uh, in, uh, in an institutional setting or a congregate setting, and we have a responsibility to those individuals and have had under the Older Americans Act, and that will continue, which is why I describe this as being an aspirational goal. It's what people want. Uh, certainly for the aging community, uh, there are times that, that they choose something different later in their life or something that they need differently, but it's what everybody has in common for their life goal, and, and that's why we chose the name. These were the um, pieces, um, last couple slides as a wrap up, I was hoping Henry could, could talk about as well. Um, but we'll cover in his absence, clearly. Uh, this seems quite new um, to people to have a, a new federal organization. Uh, and in some respects it is, but in some respects it's not. That um, aging and disability populations have been moved together 
uh, at the local level, at the state level, in different ways and different configurations. These are not communities that are foreign to each other. Uh, they exist differently in different states. Uh, we felt that the federal government, in some respects, was behind um, by not having uh, followed the lead of the states in finding a way to locate um, aging and disability together. The um, mechanisms that we have uh, to support people uh, have been brought together kind of at the state level um, in order to be able to serve both populations. And, and yet here federally, they were separate. Uh, the one place that aging and disability policy at the federal level would be already co-located would be at CMS. And uh, we feel like we are stronger as advocates, consumer advocates, uh, for the aging and disability communities uh, in our conversations with CMS if we are all together uh, having those conversations together. So um, you know, this is, you know, I guess, kind of summarizing on this slide what I already said uh, verbally. Um, before we move on, though, there was something I missed from the prior slide that I don't, we don't need to flip back to it, but let me talk about it before we move on, and that's my dual role as Assistant Secretary. Um, the Older Americans Act requires that the Assistant Secretary report directly to the Secretary. Uh, that still exists, our report, our report directly to Secretary Sebelius. And that's written in the law, and I understand why. I'm really quite pleased and quite proud uh, after three years to continue to serve as Assistant Secretary. It's important. Uh, there was a reason why the um, aging advocates lobbied for their own agency secretary position two decades ago, and that reason is still needed. Uh, we needed to find a way that we could uh, structurally combine efforts and still be faithful to both the history of the advocacy and then respectful of the law. The only way that we could do this was to accomplish what was possible. And what was possible was to create a new umbrella where I served in both positions. And so both as the administrator, I report to the secretary, and as assistant secretary for aging, I report to the secretary. I spoke yesterday to a group of developmental disability providers, and I was in the room with Sharon Lewis, the commissioner of AIDD. It's important that Sharon report to me as administrator. It's important that disability not report to me as the Assistant Secretary for Aging. Uh, and this is what now is possible. Uh, in the future, the communities will work together with a new organization. And at some point in the future, if collectively the nation wants a different configuration, then that's a conversation that can be had in the future. But I cannot at this point be the Assistant Secretary for Aging and Disability. Uh, that is a decision that the disability community must make. They have had their own designs over in the Department of Ed to elevate um, the, the work in the Department of Ed uh, to a higher level. Uh, the disability community has wanted um, something different for their future as well. So this is a nice kind of um, neutral position uh, where we can continue to uh, work together collectively. And how I describe it when I, when I talk to both audiences, uh, disability audiences or senior audiences, is that my title, Assistant Secretary for Aging, uh, represents my strong interest in advocating on behalf of older Americans and their families. My title administrator, and the way I see it quite literally is my outstretched hand, uh, that I am interested in partnering with people with disabilities, their stakeholders, their providers, to lift our issues together. I don't find this as a zero-sum game. I don't have to say one or the other, but have a responsibility to both in a slightly different way, and I will be respectful of that responsibility, and I believe uh, we're still fairly small as a group. I can carry out both, but uh, I'm still the Assistant Secretary for Aging. But I um, am supportive of people with disabilities and will be an advocate. I have a lot to learn, and I'm trying to do that as we move forward. The background slide is really just a reminder um, of the path that we've all been on together. Uh, and I gave a speech at the National HCBS conference a couple years ago. I called it my dirt road speech. Uh, aging and disability has been on a, a path together for a long time that the Americans with Disabilities Act impacted all people of all ages, uh, that the Olmstead decision impacted all people. It was a DD case primarily coming out of Georgia. Uh, there are ways we've already been working together, and for the mass, past many decades, the work that we've been doing individually has actually overlapped and informed each other. When I was doing some um, reading before I did this, this um, HCBS speech that I've mentioned, I went back and looked at the early language from the DD Act passed in 63, compared it to some of the language dropped into the Older Americans Act in 65. We have been feeding off of each other's victories and successes 
for 50 years. Uh, there are different histories and different people, but um, I do believe we are strong together, and I'm excited about what the future brings for us. Well, thank you so much uh, for that overview, and you have, in fact, uh, addressed some of the questions that our uh, audience has provided for us. I will start uh, uh, going through some of those, but several of you have asked the question about will the slides be available. Uh, in fact, the entire presentation with slides and also uh, Secretary Greenlee's comments will be made uh, available on a uh, broadcast link which will be sent directly to all of you that are registered for this. So you will receive all of those um, uh, things. Um, let's follow up on the issue that you're talking about in terms of the perception of what this means. Um, the question that, that has come in is from public perception, how does merging, does this now paint aging as a disability or uh, or, or create a perception that uh, we now have to worry about aging as a disease or a sickness. Um, do, do you see any uh, issues around those questions? Uh, I, I, under, I guess I understand why, um, why all kinds of questions are being asked. Um, I don't see aging as a disability or a disease, but its own field. Uh, there are people in the field of disability who have been serving older adults for a long time. Uh, when I look at, and, and the field of disability, I usually say in plural because there are many different fields of disability. I really do see this as a Venn diagram where there is overlapping between. There are older adults who become disabled. And whether you view that from an aging lens or a disability lens, there are people who are older with limitations. Uh, there are also many, many older adults who, who have other, other needs, uh, who need from aging services, preventive programs, who need um, support for overcoming isolation, who may be frail, isolated, alone, and, and it's not the same thing. Aging and disability are not the same thing. Even within the field, there are differences of opinion about the answer to that question. I'm giving you my perspective. I do not see that they're the same thing. Um, I'm not a person who lives with a disability. My perception is. I'm not also an older adult yet. My perception is that the life experience of aging and the life experience of living with a disability appear to me to be different life experiences, but they are also not mutually exclusive. There are overlaps between them. Okay. What about the, question, uh, the role of senior centers in uh, implementing this new uh, merged or joint program, uh, particularly in rural areas? So. You know, last week I spoke at the um, uh, N4A, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging Conference, and I knew a year ago that what I wanted to focus on this year was prevention. Uh, when I see senior centers, and I've been to many around the country, to me, from um, kind of an aging services perspective, they're our point of sale. It's where the seniors go, senior centers. And my interest is that we develop um, evidence-based programs that we can deliver to seniors in senior centers. Uh, I love area agencies on aging and aging and disability resource centers. It's more fun to visit a senior center where the seniors are, and, and they are a critical part of the aging services network. With regard to this reorganization, two things come to mind in terms of how senior centers might be helpful. Uh, one is to revisit cultural competency in the field of disability. Uh, one of the benefits of longevity for all people is that all of us are living longer and people with disabilities are living longer. So we will have people age in who already have disabilities. Are we competent to serve them? It's not about serving seniors who then become frail and old and disabled. It's about people who come to us who've been living with a disability or been disabled for a lifetime or for at least longer than before they turn 60. So how do we make sure that we are competent to serve people with disabilities? And the other is that we are already providing uh, through the Administration on Aging, integrated programs. Uh, we provide outreach counseling for people on Medicare. Uh, we sometimes shortcut our descriptions of people on Medicare, truncate it uh, to only seniors, but there are around 8 million people with disabilities who receive Medicare. Uh, look at the integrated programs that are serving all populations because that's also where we're already doing some of this work and figure out if there's other opportunities or partnerships locally to expand the offering. Uh, I think there's a lot that we have to learn uh, in the fields of research and translational programs into uh, things from the different fields that could cross-apply. 
if you're doing uh, a workshop on false prevention or you're doing a workshop on paralysis, who should come? Is it only for older adults? And that these are questions and new opportunities. Uh, the funding streams have not changed, uh, so we'll have to look for ways to support our work, but certainly this gives us new opportunities to ask the question. Let's follow up with another question about the funding stream. Uh, does this consolidation imply that there will be more funding or less funding or exactly the same amount of funding as the combined pieces? Um, now that is a tricky question. This was a revenue neutral reorganization. So this reorganization did not bring with it uh, new money for ACO. We have the same budgets that we had separately uh, in a combined way. What we have been looking for uh, since the Affordable Care Act passed were opportunities for our networks to receive additional funding, not necessarily from the Administration on Aging or AIDD, but from the opportunities coming from the Innovation Center at CMS and other places. So the opportunities for more funding, I would say, uh, we're hopeful um, that the plan would be, how can we advocate at the federal level for the community programs that we represent collectively so that as we develop policies within the broader agency, we can take advantage of them in our networks. The community care transitions work that CMS is doing is a good example in the field of aging where we have evidence-based program for, uh, for seniors and can implement those at the local level. Our partnership with the VA is a good example of an aging and disability program combined where we are partnering with the VA to provide services to veterans of all ages to help them live in their community. So we will scout together for additional money. As we develop budgets together as ACL, we will also look at opportunities where we can um, put forth ideas for increasing funding for a specific line item or for integrated programs that would cover both. Lifespan respite is a good example where the coalition that put together Lifespan respite really did cross aging and disability. And that would be kind of the kind of program that we see would help everyone. But there have also been, in the last few years, program cuts at AIDD uh, in their ability to provide innovative funding for their projects of national significance. Program cuts in Title IV at AOA. So we will need to collectively kind of address individual needs from individual programs and integrated needs uh, as well. So we'll see. Let's follow up on the uh, issue around integration of uh, programming at the federal level. And of course, we have the uh, Affordable Care Act, which is now uh, law and been upheld and is, is now being implemented. One of the questions that's come up then is how does this uh, program and the, this integration in the new administration affect dual eligibles, people that are uh, eligible for programming both under Medicaid and Medicare, and then how does that fit into the dual eligible um, programs that are being uh, talked about in the ACA? This is a complicated answer. I will try to be succinct. So I have to give you my premise in order to answer this question. I believe there are two huge transformational forces impacting seniors and people with disabilities happening right now. One is the transformation of the medical system in this country, the healthcare system, that is certainly completely entangled with the Affordable Care Act, but is also, I think, larger than the Affordable Care Act. Uh, this transformation will happen in communities and impact the people we serve. The other huge transformation happening is at the state level, as states move rapidly to manage care for Medicaid long-term supports and services. These things are happening. Those transformations are not driven by any of the programs that AIDD runs or any of the programs that the Older Americans Act runs. They're just not. Uh, when you look at the opportunities in the Affordable Care Act, they are opportunities coming from other parts of the department, kind of going around us almost to the local level. By coming together, we have positioned ourselves as a combined agency to get closer to the conversations that impact our communities, even though they're not the conversations that we lead or the decisions that we make. Uh, we come to the table with CMS saying, if you're making changes or approving things where a state is moving to Medicaid managed care, has that state engaged with the community? And then we go out to the community and say, you have to go to the table and talk. That we are a strong, we are aging and disability. We are a consumer organization for aging and disability, watching this transformation and needing to lift up to our federal partners what we see happening and, and calling to their attention opportunities for investment in our networks, but also 
a real dire need for education and technical assistance as the networks change. So the impact with regard specifically to the duals is to make sure that we maintain strong communications with leadership of CMS about how much that transformation is causing uh, concern and how much questions, how many questions there are, and really requiring many in the aging and disability networks to think differently about what their business models are. And uh, this is a whole new world, and we want to be in the middle of translating uh, so that our networks take advantage and survive uh, this huge transformation. We've talked about uh, the important role of health and human services in this whole uh, arena, but this is a question about uh, linking to housing, and particularly yes. affordable housing. So how uh, does this agency position itself in terms of relating to uh, housing and urban development as a federal uh, department in terms of meeting the affordable need, needs of affordable housing with services for older people? Excellent question. Uh, the HHS has a strong collaboration fairly formalized collaboration with um, Housing and Urban Development. Henry Claypool has been the main leader of that collaboration. If you, if you look back, you'll see that the department has framed some of that work in something called the Community Living Initiative, where we could look at community supports, homelessness, uh, community integration. Henry's really our expert and will continue to be the leader as we, as we look at housing supports. Uh, one of the outcomes of that joint effort has been uh, the work of HUD to release additional vouchers for people with disabilities to have access to uh, low-income housing. Uh, we also see that working with, with HUD just creates more opportunities uh, as we work with states and local communities about everything from money follows the person to uh, what states are doing to comply with their Olmstead responsibilities, that housing is a critical support for all of the different communities. Uh, as you start to name the major federal agencies outside of HHS that, that can benefit from or be impacted by this reorganization, I would put HUD at the top of the list. I've already mentioned the VA. Uh, I think that um, there would be some need to do additional work with um, the Department of Labor. Uh, economic security for all these populations is something that the Department of Labor also works with, as well as Social Security Administration, of course. So there are other federal agencies uh, that work on areas of aging and disability, and we want to uh, I don't want to say re-engage, we're engaged with them, but we want to be stronger in that engagement by bringing these issues together. The next one is a question about uh, trying to meet the needs of the diverse communities that you, you serve, not only in terms of aging and disability now, but uh, also in terms of uh, ethnic and racial minorities, LGBT uh, folks, and others that have been traditionally disadvantaged. Uh, are there particular actions that you're taking in terms of the, the new administration on that issue? It's absolutely um, a, a, a fundamental, I don't know, I'm kind of stammering because it's so important. I mean, it's absolutely a fundamental uh, concern and commitment of the department. Uh, we had been working at the Administration on Aging to support the Diverse Elders Coalition to bring together all of the different um, kind of minority communities, people of color, the LGBT community. I have been chairing uh, for two and a half years now the LGBT Working Group at HHS. Uh, we are having a lot of conversations across the table with each other about well, what are you doing with these populations. And I can give you a specific example that's current from last week. Um, AOA has a direct relationship with um, American Indian programs, the Title VI programs that we funded through the Administration on Aging, to talk about um, tribal elders and how we're providing services. I did a listening session last week with those grantees, and we talked most of the time about tribal elders because that's what we are funding them to do. But I also said, who is providing services to Indian children with developmental disabilities? I want to be a home for those concerns, uh, that we want to look across our programs and figure out what are we doing collectively. The common thread among these communities often is long-term supports and services that impacts all communities. Someone asked a question about what we do in rural parts of the country. Uh, how can we learn from each other and, and find gaps? Uh, through AIDD uh, and the work that they do with the Disability Rights Centers, there's one program around the country that serves uh, American Indians. Uh, how can we learn from them? What are they doing? And who's covering the rest of the country? And that's just an example from last week with regard to um, elders, uh, Indian elders, Native American elders. Uh, but this is equally necessary for all the different communities that we serve. Uh, the goal, I think, when you talk about diversity of any kind is to identify barriers and figure out how to remove them 
and we will need to do that collectively now for aging and disability. That's great. Um, if you could talk also about the, the important role that volunteers play uh, in all of these segments of the population and, and what uh, the new administration is doing to, to help with uh, fostering the role of volunteers. You know, volunteers have, have been really created to be the backbone of the Aging Services Network. Uh, we have so many people on the phone who I hope are shaking their heads that, that know this, uh, whether it's the meals programs, the long-term long -term care ombudsman program, the senior Medicare patrol program, having volunteers at senior centers. I don't know as much about the nature of volunteer work in the disability community, and, and you know, I keep saying I'm, I'm learning uh, what the best way is to um, kind of leverage the opportunities of volunteerism and disability. I need to learn. What I think of most immediately are the integrated programs where we're doing uh, education with, um, with SHIP counselors or SHIP counselors across the country on disability. Uh, on, excuse me, on Medicare that covers aging and disability. But I'll need to talk to Sharon about volunteer, and if there are people on the call who have lots of ideas and education for me on volunteer opportunities uh, kind of in the disability um, sector, uh, I'd be glad to learn about that because I know those better on the aging side where they've been just really essential. A similar sort of question uh, having to do with uh, you, you personally and certainly the the administration has been very involved in the whole question of elder abuse in all of its forms. Uh, you recently were one of the hosts of the, the first White House conference on uh, on elder abuse, particularly focused on uh, financial abuse. Um, there's obviously a corresponding part on, in the disability community where uh, vulnerable populations may be subject to abuse. What, what are the special efforts that you're looking at in that area? There, the First of all, I'm still pretty hepped up about the White House event that we did for World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Uh, I will continue to take a strong position on talking about elder abuse, but I will also look for, for bridging opportunities into the disability community. Uh, what I have been able to learn so far, and it's through some of our work, uh, quite honestly, with the Institute of Medicine who's looking at violence, violence prevention, is that people who have a cognitive impairment are at tremendous risk for financial exploitation. That would be true of someone with a cognitive impairment who was older or someone with a cognitive impairment who was younger. Uh, if there are opportunities to bridge between these conversations, I will find a way to do that. We have to keep talking about elder abuse, for me, as elder abuse. I think there's a social movement that's behind to talk about elder abuse. Younger vulnerable adults it's a slightly different population. We also have to recognize that Adult Protective Services, often in states, covers all populations, and so how can we strengthen all supports? But there are differences in vulnerabilities based on aging and disability, and we need to be respectful that people who have um, their cognitive abilities intact have the ability to make their own life choices, whether we agree with those or not. So how do we lift up an issue, not be paternalistic, and cross-apply it to all populations, but look certainly at risks, and cognitive impairment is a risk. Uh, let's take that as an example, just someone with a developmental disability, at least a big, significantly cognitively disabled, and an older person. Uh, you could look at both of those and say they're similar risks. There are different opportunities. An older person with Alzheimer's may have a nest egg that a younger person never had the chance to acquire. So it's talking about risk, but also talking about uh, the intervention and the opportunity for someone to abuse them, and how do we intervene to support them. Another question that is similar in the sense that it, it talks about the similarities and differences between the populations that you're serving, and that's about the role of um, grandparents and caregivers in providing for services. So uh, certainly we know in the, the whole the whole question about uh, caregiver support in the aging population and also the role of parents and grandparents in taking care of what initially were younger uh, disabled uh, persons and now folks uh, who have now grown older and, and the challenges that that has. So how do you see those uh, things similar and different? You know, I think that there is a lot of similarity between the fields, but I don't think they're identical. But I, but I do see um, more and more overlap. There are, um, when we talk about the field of aging, we're typically talking about um, older adults taking care of each other, a spouse taking care of each other as a caregiver, 
or an adult family member taking care of an older adult. There are issues in there about stress, support, and respite that has a lot in common with being an older adult taking care of a child with a disability, but also a lot that's very different, uh, both in terms of maybe the term, the tenure, the needs of the person providing the care, the needs of the person receiving the care, and the opportunities for the person who is younger with a disability to gain more independence. The person who's older is often losing their independence. There are differences, uh, but there are also similarities, and that's what I think is best reflected in something like the Lifespan Respite Coalition, uh, that, that all people need to break, that caregivers have so much in common in terms of doing this out of a sense of, of their love for their family member, their concern for their family member, but also their own needs, um, their own physical needs, their own need to work. So I think we need to find kind of what's common, what's different, not always talk about them in the same vein. They're not exactly the same, um, but, but they intersect. And older adults who are caring for an adult child with a developmental disability bring this issue to all of these communities. Uh, there is a need for life planning for both. And so it's, um, you know, I also have this, I can just throw this out. I also have this great love of, um, uh, the contribution of caregivers in the developmental disability kind of history and world that, um, as I learn, and, and this started before I came to Washington, but in Kansas, as I learned from my colleagues in the field of developmental disabilities, it's really the family that demanded services for their children. And I think they demonstrated to us as a nation the power of caregivers, caregivers with a mission who are demanding different kind of care. I hope that that sort of uh, inclination and motivation can translate to caregivers caring for a senior population because uh, they are a powerful force. They have demonstrated to us historically in this country that they can be. And uh, I think we have a lot to learn. Uh, that's a wonderful segue into what is going to be our final question before I allow you to uh, wrap up uh, today's session, which is how can, uh, how can community members and advocates help to advocate for the work that you're going to be doing in this new administration? To, I, I think the mission at every level is the same that I've articulated for the Administration for Community Living, which is to find the balance between recognizing the differences that people have and the commonalities that people have, and not ever assume that everything's going to line up nice and tidy. There are differences between these communities. They have different histories. We have treated people with disabilities and seniors differently in this country. And there's a civil rights background in the field of disability that must be respected by the field of aging and is different. So how do we say, who are you? What do you need? And not try to make you like me, um, but find what we have in common and, and sit with that and, and learn from that. Um, as we have um, moved forward and talked about administration for community living, I just wanted to, I guess, end and share the feedback that we've gotten. Not everybody is completely happy, and I know that. Um, by and large, people are hopeful and optimistic and willing to be supportive because there's so much that we have to do that we can do together. And to the degree that we hear concern, we hear the same concern from all the populations. And this is one of those times where, you know, we all work on issues where you think someone's worrying about the wrong thing. This is not that case. I think that the concern that has been lifted to us is the concern that people should have and the one that we must be responsible for. And that's that people don't get lost. Uh, people in aging are worried because aging is not in the name. They don't want aging to get lost. People with disabilities have the same concern because there are more people who are old than people with disabilities. And there are huge budgets that support people who are aging. People with disabilities don't want to get lost. So our responsibility as leaders, our responsibility really both at the federal level and locally is to do both, is to make sure people don't get lost. And, uh, and if we do that and we respect their differences, find what they have in common, I really do think we are really strong together. It's about helping people live good lives and having them connected to themselves and their community and the supports they need. And then it's not about trying to think that they're all the same. And if you love advocating for seniors, please keep doing it. And if you have specialized in advocating for children with developmental disabilities, do it. And if you're nothing about us without us from the physically disabled movement, go. Keep doing it. Uh, we will find the common threads. And I think that we will be stronger. Thank you for that wonderful summary. 
Uh, we want to remind everyone, because we continue to have some questions about this, that the whole uh, webinar today will be provided to all of you that have registered as a rebroadcast link, uh, that it's also available to be reused by anyone who is interested, but it will contain both all of the audio as well as the slides, uh, so all of that will be coming to you. I want to thank Secretary Kathy Greenley for joining us today. Thank you for your passion for everything you do to make life better for older adults and persons with disabilities. I also want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation for their support of this program, as well as the American Society on Aging for their technical expertise. And finally, I want to thank all of you for your hard work and dedication to meeting the needs of the populations you serve. Thank you for participating in today's webinar, and have a great day.